we're going to look now at some of the Kikulin plays. The Hawk's Well gives us Kikulin as a young, vigorous, and proud man. He seeks the waters of immortality. But an old man warns Kikulin of the curse, that if he remains in place at a well, he will fall into a stupor, and the spirit of a hawk will take possession of the girl, his lover. The old man warns him that if he looks in her eyes, while in a state of her possession, he will never know love unmixed with hatred. In another of Kikulin's plays, The Jealousy of Emer, Emer tries to summon her husband back after drowning in Baal's strand. Uh, she hates Kikulin's mistress. Athan and Guba, who kisses Kikulin's lifeless body. Kikulin doesn't return, but his spirit returns. But instead of his life being the way it was, there we, we encounter an ugly, distressed spirit, the spirit of Drikru. Drikru gives Emer a second sight, and she sees Kekulin with the goddess Fand, F-A-N-D, and becomes jealous of him, so that the jealousy of Emer becomes a major work. The plays of Kekulin each deal with not the heroic action of Kekulin, but the way that his life is frustrated, the way that his loves are disappointed, the way that jealousy turns and destroys his being. And as I've mentioned before, in his encounter with his only son, whose identity he doesn't know, he in fact commits infanticide, killing the child. The Death of Kekulin, the final play, is a rather interesting play itself. An old man in the play introduces the death of Kukulin. One of the problems with the times was that Yeats was disappointed that the ideals of Irish drama had been rejected. And the play is a rather complex play. But we have a number of people from this class who are going to read parts from it. I'm going to try to detail some of the events and see whether we can anticipate or discover how they play out in this show. In the death of Kekulin, we have an old man who has difficulty remembering his parentage. Yeats brings in the music of Homer and the ritual dance of Emir amidst severed heads. Now, the idea that there are severed heads is part of the Irish tradition. There's one tale where an Irish king actually was known to have brought the head of his enemy into a banquet and dined off it. This was the primitive nature old Ireland. Where did Yeats get this idea of severed heads? Well, among ideas that seemed to generate was interested in the Salome, Salome myth, where Salome uh, danced before the severed head of John the Baptist. Now, uh, Wilde had written a play called uh, Salome, in which these scenes were a, uh, featured. And so, 
the idea of the severed head, the idea of this primitive vengeance, is part of the death of Kukulin. And of course, it has to do with Yeats' desire not to present plays that are sentimental. Now, we have in this play, the scene opens with lights on a bare stage. And we have a figure by the name of Etna Inguba, his mistress, who is searching for Cahulin. Now, Emmer, his wife, warns Cahulin to avoid battle until the arrival of Colonel Kernech with a supportive army. However, Mev, who hates Cahulin for other reasons, urges him in Emmer's name pretending that Emir has given this message, to engage battle immediately. And Maev plotting Kikulin's death represents the ultimate hatred. Kikulin reads but ignores Emir's note. Now the Moragu, these mystical figures with crow's heads coming from Eastern culture are featured because they hear Cahulin's bellicose war, his, his, his call for war. As the play moves on, we find that Emir and Maev use Etna in a struggle for Cahulin's body and soul. Ethne realizes that she has lost Cahulin to the war goddess, to Mev. Ethne's description of Mev reminds one of Earth, A O I F E, who is a variant of the Maragu. We'll see how this plays out. It sounds very obscure. It's really quite, quite occult. Uh, Yeats is using images from other cultures in order to try to give us a sense of an ancient culture, of ritual, of revenge, of the suffering of the hero, all of which become part of the Irish experience. Ethne warns Cahulin that he is in the grasp of forces greater than humans can know. Now, Cahulin attacks Ethne with cynicism. He realizes that death is coming, but he's going to, in some ways, do what he can to face it. In this cycle of the moons, and we'll be spending more time with it next week, in the cycle of the moons, the last cycle is represented by three characterizations of human behavior. In this case, Cahulin enters the first of three final phases of the journey of the soul, the phase of the hunchback, the death of passion. Now, where the images come from is a concern of folklore. But the hunchback is the first of the last phase because with his deformation, with his suffering, and perhaps the Yates may be going back to Hugo's a, a story of Quasimodo, you have where you have passion and then ultimately the loss of passion. You see him moving toward the grave, reconciling himself to his deformities of life. And he may be a perfectly fine looking person, but it's the deformities of life that have turned him into this hunchback. And so we have the death of passion. Kekulin accuses Ethne of loving a younger man. That's who's left now that he no longer is replete with this sexual passion. Ethne is stirred to show pride, and she herself expects to suffer an heroic death. Now, what does that, how is that death of hers going to come about? With Kekulin's death, 
she will have herself killed by her servants. She will goad them on, and she claims that the basest servant, the most impotent servant, the servant of lowest character, at the point where Cahulan is dying, that servant will have more passion than he. And when you lose your passion for love, then you're ready for death. By the way, this is also biblical. If you remember in the Bible, David is, at, at the end of day, King David's life, the Bible says David is old and cold. Once he is cold, he has lost his sexual passion. He cannot breed new children. Therefore, he cannot lead the nation, and he will die. What do the Hebrews do? They bring young Abishag, a teenage girl, to try to stir David. And she can't do it. And the next chapter, David is dead, and Solomon is going to. So, so there's a biblical motif to the idea of the loss of, lock, loss of passion. And once you lose the passion, you no longer are the ruler. A servant tells Cahulin that his horse has been saddled, the bit has been put in place. A servant suggests that Etne, who is suffering now the loss of Cahulin, be drugged with poppy ju juice. Etne mourn mourns, not her fate, but Cahulin. Now the second Cahulin enters the second stage, which is the stage of the wounded. He meets F, who is a tall, white-haired woman. And Cahulin in the second last phase on this great wheel, this cycle, secular wheel of the moon, he enters the phase of the saint. This is when he can issue his penitence, when he knows he's dying. And as he nears death, the figures of the past appear to him. And a blind man moves Cahulin into the final stage, the stage of the fool, when your senses are no longer uh, with you. The blind man moves to steal Cahulin's head. Cahulin and F. relive the love scene near Hawk's Well. Remember I mentioned that first play, or the, the second play that Yates had done. Cahulin and F. relive the love scene near Hawk's Well when he asserts his masculine, when he asserted his masculine power. As you're dying, the good times one remembers. And Cahulin recognizes F. Cahulin is in confusion as he approaches death. He has himself bound to a pillar stone. And at death he apprises listeners of his life cycle. The pillar stone becomes a symbol of a gravestone or a symbol of stability or a stationary place that one can call one's final resting place. If wraps her veil around Cahulin. Now this is very interesting. As she wraps her veil around Cahulin, and as he is dying, you have a switch. She becomes the one motivated. She becomes the one moving. She becomes the one's passion. <coughs> Some of the commentators says, have said, she becomes the masculine force, and he wrapped in a veil becomes the feminine dying force. So the death of Cahulin has a number of motifs in it that are important to Yeats's philosophy. Number one, it deals with imagery from the East. Number two, it deals with biblical imagery. Number three, it deals with the loss of strength and the loss of power. Number four, it deals with the memories that make life worthwhile and then make it understandably time to die. All these motifs become part of the Irish tradition, which is not a happy heroic tradition, but it's a, a sad tradition and a, a tradition uh, replete with impotency, 
rejection, loss, despair, suffering, and only memories to tide one's hopes to an ideal that has failed. Well, these are the basic motifs in the death of Cahulin. Now, what we're going to do is ask the members of the class to come up here to the microphone, and we're going to act this out. Now, this is relatively spontaneous. Some of you haven't seen the play before this evening, but uh, with my interpretation and with your uh, understanding of these uh, uh, riches that we're about to look at, we'll look at the death of Cahoolin. So would you come up, please, and form a circle in front of this microphone. And let's make sure we have all the parts. Who's going to do Kahulin? The mistress Ethnet Inguba. You may introduce your name so everyone knows who you are. All right. F. And you list. M. R. There is. Okay. Well, do you want to dance? <laughs> You can dance. Do we have an old man? I'm the old man. Okay. Charles Cross. A blind man? I'm the blind man, Robert Boyle. A servant? You'll be the servant. I'm the servant. Yes, come up and do the servant. And the servant and the singer. Servant and the singer. <laughs> and Kahulin? All right, let's get everyone up here. <laughs> Everyone has to be up on the platform so we can see see you in the screen. All right. First of all, let me eliminate this background here. Those of you in the woodlands, you hear what's going on? Hi, woodlands. I think they turned the sound off. <laughs> All right, we are now to begin the University of Houston's <laughs> ITV production uh -oh. of the Death uh -oh. of Kahulan. <laughs> All right, we have. I've been asked to produce a play called The Death of Kukulan. It's the last of a series of plays which has foreseen his life and death. I have been selected because I'm out of fashion. And I'm late, like the antiquated romantic stuff the thing is made of. I'm so old, I have forgotten the name of my father and mother. Unless indeed I am, as I affirm, the son of Tama. And he was so old that his friends and acquaintances still read Virgil and Homer. When they told me that I could have my own way, I wrote certain guiding principles on a bit of newspaper. I wanted an audience of 50 or 100, and if there were more, I begged them not to shuffle their feet or talk when the actors were speaking. I am sure that as I am producing a play for people, 
I like, it is not probable in this vile age that they will be more in number than those who listen to the first performance of Milton's Comus. On the present occasion, they must know the old epics in Mr. Yeats' plays about them. Such people, however, have poor, such people, however, poor have libraries of their own. If there are more than a hundred, I won't be able to escape people who are educating themselves out of the book societies, book clubs, and the like. Oh, Scarlet sauce, <coughs> pickpockets, and opinionated bitches. <laughs> Why pickpockets? Well, I will explain that, and I will make it all quite clear. That's for you musicians. I asked them to do that if I was getting excited. If you were as old, you would get, find it easy to get excited. Before the night ends, you will meet the music. There is a singer, a piper, and a drummer. I pick them up here and there about the streets, and I will teach them, if I live, the music of the beggar man, Homer's music. I promise a dance. I wanted a dance because, well, where there are no words, there is less to spoil. A mare must dance. There must be severed heads. I am old. I belong to mythology. Severed heads for her to dance before. I had thought to have had those heads carved, but no, if the dancer can dance properly, no wood carving can look as well as a parallelogram of painted wood. But I was at my wit's end to find a good dancer. I could have got such a dancer once, but she is gone. The tragic comedian dancer, the tragic dancer, upon the same neck, love and loathing, life and death, I spit three times. I spit upon the dancers painted by Degas. I spit upon their short bodices, their stiff stays, their toes whereon they spin like peg tops. Above all, that chambermaid face. It might have looked timeless, Ramesses the Great, but not the chambermaid, that old maid history. I spit, I spit, I spit. Kukulin. I am Emmer's messenger. I am your wife's messenger. She has bid me say, you must not linger here in sloth, for Maeve, with all those conic ruffians at her back, burns barns and houses up at Emain Matcha. Your house at Marathim already burns. No matter what the o what's the odds, no matter though, your death may come of it. Ride out and fight. The scene is set and you must out and fight. You have told me nothing. I am already armed. I have sent a messenger to gather man and wait for his return. What have you there? I have nothing. Is there something in your hand? No. Have you not a letter in your hand? I do not know how it got into my hand. I am straight from Emir. We were in some place. She spoke, she saw. This letter is from Emir. That tells a different story. I am not to move until tomorrow morning. For if now I must face odds no man can face and live. Tomorrow morning, Kamal Kanak comes with a great host. I do not understand. How can, who could, who can have put that letter in my hand? And there's something more to make it certain I shall not stir till morning. You are sent to be my bedfellow, but have no fear. All that is written, but I much prefer your own unwritten words. I am for the fight. I and my handful are set upon the fight. We have faced great odds before. A straw decided. I know that somebody or something is there yet nobody that I can see. There is nobody. Who among the gods of the air in the upper air has a bird's head? Moragu is headed like a crow. Moragu, war goddess, stands between them? Her black wing touched me upon the shoulder, and now all is intelligible. Mave put me in a trance. Though when Kukulan slept with her as a boy, she seemed as pretty as a bird. She has changed. She has an eye in the middle of her forehead. A woman that has an eye in the middle of her forehead, a woman that is headed like a crow, but she hath put those words into your mouth, had nothing monstrous. You put them there yourself. You need a younger man, a friendlier man, but fearing what my violence might do, thought out those words to send me to my death, and were in such excitement you forgot that letter in your hand. Now that I wake, I say that Mob did nothing out of error. What mouth could you believe if not my mouth? When I went mad at my son's death and drew my sword against the sea, it was my wife that brought me back. Better woman than I have served you well, but twas to me you turned. You thought that if you had changed, I'd kill you for it, when everything sublunary must change. And if I have not changed, that goes to prove that I am monstrous. You're not the man I loved. 
That violent man forgave no treachery. I'm thinking what you think you can forgive. It is because you are about to die. Spoken too loudly and too near the door. Speak low if you would speak about my death, or not in that strange voice exulting in it. Who knows what ears listen behind the door? Some that would not forgive a traitor. Some that have the passion necessary to life, but not about to die. When you are gone, I shall deni denounce myself to all your cooks, scullions, armor armorers, bedmakers, and messengers, until they hammer me with a ladle, cut me with a knife, impale me up on a spit, put me to death by what foul way be best please their fancy, so that my shade can stand among the shades and greet your shade and prove it no as no traitor. Women have so spoken, so plotting a man's death. Your great horse is bitted. I'll wait the word. I come to give it, but must ask a question. This woman, wild with grief, declares that she, out of pure treachery, has told me lies that should have brought my death. What can I do? How can I save her from her own wild words? Is her confession true? I make the truth. I say she brings a message for my wife. What if I make her swallow poppy juice? What herb seems suitable but protect her life as it, if it were her own? And should I not return, give her to Conoconic, because the women have called him a good lover? I might have peace that now the morgue, the woman like a crow, stands to my defense and cannot lie, but that Cucullan is about to die. Am I recognized, Cucullan? Your thoughts were the sword, a scene that we should kill each other. Then your body weird, and I took your sword. But look again, Cucullan, look again. Your hair is white. That time was long ago, and now it is my time. I have come to kill you. Where am I? Why am I here? You asked their leave when certain that you had six mortal wounds to drink out of the pool. I put my belt about this stone and want to fasten it and die upon my feet, but I'm too weak. Fasten this belt. Uh, I know I, and now I know your name. Aif, the mother of my son. We met at the hawk's well under the wither trees. I killed him upon Balestrand. That is why I may have parted ranks that she might let you through. You have a right to kill me. Though I have, her army did not part to let me through. The gray of Maka, that great horse of yours killed in the battle, came out of the pool as though it were alive, and went three times in a great circle round you and that stone, then leaped into the pool, and not a man of all that terrified army dare approach. But I approach. Because you have the right. But I am an old woman now, and that your strength may not start up when the time comes, I wind my veil about this ancient stone and fasten down your hands. But do not spoil your veil. Your veils are beautiful some with threads of gold. I am too old to care for such things now. There was no reason to spoil your veil. I am weak from the loss of blood. I was afraid, but now that I have wound you in the veil, I am not afraid. Our son, how did he fight? Age makes more skillful, but not better men. I have been told you did not know his name, and wanted, because he had a look of me, to be his friend. But Conchabar forbade it. Forbade it, and commanded me to fight. That very day I had sworn to do as well, yet I refused him and spoke about a look. But somebody spoke of witchcraft, and I said witchcraft had made the look and fought and killed him. Then I went mad and fought against the sea. You seemed invulnerable. You took my sword. You threw me on the ground and left me there. I searched the mountain for your sleeping place and laid my virgin body at your side. And yet, because you had left me, hated you and thought that I would kill you in your sleep. And yet begot a son that night between the two blackthorn trees. I cannot understand. Because about to die, somebody comes, some countryman, and when he finds you there and none to protect him, will be terrified. I will keep out of his sight, for have things that I must ask questions on before I kill you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, I think you're a blind old man. A blind old beggar man. What is your name? Kukulain. They say that you are weak with wounds. I stood between a fool and the sea at Bailey Strand when you went mad. What's bound about, about your hands so that they cannot move? Some womanish stuff? I have been fumbling with my stick since the dawn and then, and then heard many voices. I began to beg. Somebody said that I was in Mauve's tent and somebody else, a big man by his voice, that I, if I brought Kukulan's head in a bag, I would then be given 12 pennies. I had the bag to carry what I get at kitchen doors. Somebody told me how to find the place. I thought it would have taken till the night. But this has been my lucky day. 12 pennies.
Any? I would not promise anything until the woman, the great Queen Mauve herself, repeated the words. Twelve pennies. What better reason for killing a man? You have a knife, but have you sharpened it? I keep it sharp because it cuts my food. I think that you know everything, blind man. My mother or my nurse said that the blind know everything. No, but they have good sense. I could have, I could have got twelve pennies for your head if I had not good sense. There floats out there the shape that I shall take when I am dead. My soul's first shape, a soft feathery shape. And is not that a strange shape for a soul of a great fighting man? Your shoulder is there. This is your neck. Ah, ah. Are you ready, Kuluan? I say it's about to sing. Ah, ah. The dead can hear me, and to the dead I speak. This head is great Kukulan's. Those other six gave him six mortal, six mortal wounds. This man came first. Youth lingered, though the years ran on. That season, a woman loves the best, Maeve's latest lover. This man had given him the second wound. He had possessed her once. These were her sons, two valiant men that gave the third and fourth. These other men were men of no account. They saw that he was weakening and crept in. One gave him the sixth wound and one the fifth. Colonel avenged him. I arranged the dance. The harlot sang to the beggar man. I meet them face to face. Kanal, Kukulun, Asna's boys, all that most ancient race. Maeve had three in an hour, they say. I adore those clever eyes, those muscular bodies, but can get no grip upon their thighs. I meet those long pale faces, hear their great horses, then recall what centuries have passed since they are living men, that there are still some living that do my limbs unclothe, but that the flesh, my flesh is gripped, I both adore and loathe. Are those things that men adore and loathe their sole reality? What stood in the post office with Purse and Connolly? What comes out of the mountain where men first shed their blood? Who thought Coquelin till it seemed he stood where they had stood? No body like his body has modern woman born, but an old man looking back on life imagines it in scorn. A statue's there to mark the place by Oliver Shepherd Dunn. So ends the tale that the harlot sang to the beggar man. Holland becomes a relatively impressive play by virtue of the voices and by virtue of the commitment of each voice <laughs> to its motivation toward Cahoolan's death or toward his salvation, toward his memories, or toward his revival. <clears throat> there is a poem in your book that deals with the Cahoolan myth. It's called Cahoolan Comforted. And uh, there is a poem in your book called Cahoolan Comforted. And I'd like to turn to that because I'd like to. It, 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 summarizes some of the details of this particular play. It was written in 1939, and I'll give you the motifs of this particular poem. If you look on the screen, when you give a presentation, of course, these are some of the details we want. And those of you who are at the uh, Woodland can see this as well. The poem written by William Butler Yeats is divided into stanzas. The stanzas are in three lines each, in what we call a terza rima motif. Stanza one, we discover a man with six wounds among the dead. And if you remember at the end of the uh, play, The Death of Cahoolan, he had six wounds. Shrouded figures utter vocal sounds around him. These are like the ombre or the shades. Stanza three, a bird-like shroud, 
a, 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 a bird with a shroud on it drops a bundle of linen. And the figures claim life will be sweeter as a result. We discover that people should seek the shroud, not battle arms. The hero should seek the shroud, not battle arms, because he is now in death. The shady figures thread a needle. They give him a needle to show, sew up the shroud. And the man begins to sew. Some of the shades, some of these people who have given the hero this shroud, admit they are convicted cowards. They refuse to fight, and they were executed or sent to jail. Some have run away, and they've died in fear without being convicted. But they are, of course, lived this terrible life of fear and non-commitment. In stanza nine, which is one line, they are identified with birds. These could be the morigo. Now, these are the major movements in this particular poem. Let's look at the symbols that we see here. The symbols are stigmata or war wounds. The tree could be likened to a crucifix. The shroud, of course, is the symbol of death. The needles are the initiative or self-will. The act of sewing is the commitment and the finality of death. And the birds are the spiritualized dead. There are rhetorical forces. I'm sorry, there are rhetorical techniques used here. One of them is the isocolon. An isocolon is any phrase that is balanced one way or the other. So you find words like violent and famous. Or next phrase, <coughs> they came and were gone. Again, the balance. Each is a balanced phrase. The isocolon means a balance. Nor human notes, nor words. Neither the songs nor the words, you have the balance. There is, in personification, a rhetorical technique, the ne technique of metonymy, the shrouds that muttered. That is, these are dead who are speaking from the grave. These are shrouds that seem to have authority. Shrouds that muttered. Then we always know that Yeats is referring to the ancient Gaelic tradition to ancient rule. This would be an epithet where you have an adjective and a noun. This is the epitheton. The style of the poem is terza rima, and a number of cantos. There are nine. The prime narrator is omniscient and intrusive. He comes into the poem. The rhyme scheme is iambic pentameter, and the rhyme pattern is basically one rhyme, no rhyme, rhyme. So the, of the terza rima, the three lines, the first and last rhyme. Now, you may not look at this poem and think you see rhymes, but you've got to try to get an Irish pronunciation in them. Uh, the poem is discussed and summarized in Dorothy Wellesley's uh, book, The Letters, I'm sorry, Yeats summarized the spirit of this poem in a letter that he wrote to Dorothy Wellesley. It was published in 1940. If you want to study articles about these works, and what you should do when you attempt to study Yeats is first read the poem, or read the story, read the tale, and try to get some meaning out of it by yourself. Then if you have to go into historical detail or mythological detail, it's worthwhile to conduct a database search in the library. 
go to the MLA bibliography and look up the articles. There are 44 articles from 1987 till the present that deal with Kahulam. There are 313 articles written about Yates. One of those articles is withheld meaning in Yeats's poem, Cahoolan Comforted, the poem I just discussed with you. This article appears in the Journal of the Australasian Universities Language and Literature Association. It was published in 1982. It's a six-page article. The nature of heroism suggests that the world is replete with unheroic figures. Cahoolan suffers the fate of all men, noble and ignoble, in death. And the heroic path, the heroic past, is encapsulated in the dead as shades. Now, the dead as shades is Greek. The Greeks didn't believe in a hell or a heaven. They did believe that when you died, you went to the shades. You became a shade. You became an ombre. And this is where Yeats gets this classical idea. Another article is Imagination and Revolution, the Cahoolan myth, which appeared in a book called Irish Culture and Nationalism, dealing with the myth from 1750 to 1950. This is where I got some of the information on Cahoolan that I recited you, to you tonight. And uh, we discover, of course, in this article that the Cahoolan myth is a tale of a tragic hero the tra discovery of a national hero beset with tragedy elucidates the tale of Ireland's past and present. Now, with these details, this is essentially the way you're going to be expected to deliver these presentations. And the outline I gave you, I have followed in this, presen this recent presentation. Now let me read you a few lines from the uh, comfort of Cahoolan. Cahoolan comforted. It reads this way. A man that had six mortal wounds, a man virulent and famous, strode among the dead. I stared out of the branches and were gone. Then certain shrouds that muttered head to head came and were gone. He leant upon a tree as though to meditate on wounds and blood. Imagine meditating on wounds and blood. This is the poet trying to get the emotion of Cahoolan comforted. Remember, they've given him his shroud, and he's supposed to sew it, to him, sew it himself. A shroud that seemed to have authority among those bird-like things came and let fall a bundle of linen. Shrouds by two and three came, creeping up because the man was stale. And thereupon that linen carrier said, Your life can grow much sweeter if you will obey our ancient rule and make a shroud. The poem, Cahoolan Com Comforted, is a companion to Cahoolan War Against the Sea, and it fits in with the plays that we talked about, Hawk's Well and the Death of Cahoolan. Now I would like to turn to another play that Yeats wrote. It's the last play of his life. It's called Purgatory. And it again deals with a tragedy, and we'll see what that tragedy says. In this work, a boy and an old man return to a house. The house has been burned down. land has been destroyed. 
We hear of stories and jokes told by the butler and a drunken, drunken gamekeeper. This was a house of people of influence. And the gamekeeper and the butler used to joke and play around amongst this affluence. Then we see the image of a tree torn apart by a thunderbolt. The old man sees a ghost in the house. By the way, the presence of ghosts is formidable in Irish literature. The souls in purgatory return to the house because there are transgressions that have bred guilt and caused the return to this experience. Now, the st what we have here is an old, an old man and a boy together. And the boy considers the old man crazy. Then the old man tells of the story. His mother, the old man's mother, fell in love with a stable groom. The fellow on his estate who took care of their horses. And they engage in a love affair. And the woman's mother never spoke to her again after she married the groom. She wanted nothing to do with that. She married below her status. The old man is the progeny of this marriage. He was born of the consummation of this marriage between the daughter of the wealthy family and the groom. And the house has a history of politics and government. The boy says, boy, I wish I had fine horses. I wish I had lived in a fine house. I wish I had all the advantages you had when you were a boy my age. The old man says that the groom didn't want his son to have a better education than he did. So he deprived the old man of an education, but the old man learned to read regardless. He learned to read regardless. He educated himself. The boy says, why didn't I learn to read? And the old man says, I gave the education that befits a bastard that a peddler got upon a tinker's daughter in a ditch. He's degrading his family relations. Then the old man says that his father burnt the house, burnt the books, burnt everything when the old man was 16 years old. And the boy realizes he is 16 years old. So the old man suffered as a youth when he was 16. Here's his son with him, who is 16. The life cycle continues one generation to the next. And then we discover, we see, the old man envisions his mother and his father consummating their love again. He watches the groom's men and the daughter mount the stairs to their bedchamber. He watches them ha in a sexual encounter creating himself, the old man. These are the memories of the past. The question is whether this ghostly presentation can renew the sexual act, whether it can actually occur, whether new life can be born again, or whether these events no longer can be reported. Then at that moment, the old man sees the boy stealing his money. The boy feels he's entitled to something. The boy justifies his actions because he felt he's been deprived. And the old man and the boy struggle for the bag of money that the boy has stolen from the old man. And what you get there is the Oedipal conflict. Father and son fighting with each other, just as the father had fought with his groomsmen, his father, over another thing we'll hear about in a moment. We see a vision where the father is shown drinking from the whiskey glass, the groomsmen. The mother is shown before the father's birth, the old man's birth. The old man 
who told the story about his father, a groomsman, now stabs his son. And we find out that he stabs his son with the same knife that he had used to stab his father to death. The reason they've come back to this house is because this old man is guilt-ridden with the death of his father. He has committed the ultimate act. He has committed patricide. He has destroyed the man who gave him birth. And he realizes that as a pollution that he must suffer. But he feels if he committed this terrible act of patricide, his son because sons repeat the mistakes of their fathers, may also be doomed. Here he is thieving. Here he is stealing. What else is he going to do? And so the old man kills his son because he doesn't want the pollution of the family to continue into the next generation and into future generations. The rationale for killing his son, he says in this play, I killed the lad. Because had he grown up, he would have struck a woman's fancy, begot and passed pollution on. There's a very fine edition of this play, Purgatory, a manuscript where we have the complete handwriting and the manuscripts of William Butler Yeats, a book edited by Sandra Siegel in 1986. What I'd like to do now is enact purgatory. And Mr. Dornbus uh, is going to come up and is going to read the part of the old man, and I'll take the boy. And we'll just play out purgatory. Remember, they come to this burned out house. It's on. What's this one? <clears throat> We're on page 225. Those of you who have the text, page 225. The old man, the boy. Half door, half door. Hither and thither, day and night, hill or hollow, shoulder in this pack, hearing you talk. Study that house. I think about its jokes and stories. I try to remember what the butler said to a drunken gamekeeper in mid-October, but I cannot. If I cannot, none living can. What are the jokes and stories of a house, its threshold gone to patch a pigsty? So you have come this path before? The moonlight falls upon the path, the shadow of a cloud upon the house. And that's symbolical. Study that tree. What is it like? A steady old man. It's like, no matter what it's like. I saw it a year ago, stripped bare of snow. I saw it 50 years ago, before the thunderbolt had riven it. Green leaves, ripe leaves, leaves thick as butter, fat, greasy life. Stand there and look, because there is no, there is somebody in that house. There's nobody there. There's somebody there. <laughs> the floor is gone. The window's gone. And where there should be a roof, this guy. The soul's in purgatory that come back. Uh, and here's a bit of an eggshell thrown out of a jackdaw's nest. But there are some that do not care what's gone, what's left. The soul's in purgatory that come back to habitations in familiar spots. Their wits are out again. Relive their transgressions, and that not once but many times. They know at last the consequence of those transgressions, whether upon others or upon themselves. Upon others, others may bring help, for when the consequence is at an end, the dream must end. Upon themselves, there is no help but in themselves and in the mercy of God. I've had enough. Talk to the jackdaws if it talks you must. Stop. Sit there upon that stone. That is the house where I was born. The big old house that was burned down? My mother, that was your granddam, owned it. The scenery and this countryside, kennel and stable, horse and hound. She had a horse at the Curragh, and there met my father, a groom in a training stable. Looked at him and married him. Her mother never spoke to her again. And she did right. What's right and wrong? 
The grub that got the girl and the money. Looked at him and married him, and he squandered everything she had. She never knew the worst because she died in giving birth to me. But now she knows it all, being dead. Great people lived and died in that house. Magistrates, colonels, members of parliament, captains and governors, and long ago men that had fought at Agram and the Blaine. Some that had gone on government work to London or to India came home to die, or came from London every spring to look at the May Blossom in the park. They had loved the trees that he cut down to pay what he had lost at cards or spent on horses, drink, and women. Had loved the house and had loved all the intricate passages of the house, but he killed the house. To kill a house where great men grew up, married, died, I here declare a capital offense. Oh my God, but you had luck, grand clothes, and, and maybe a grand horse to ride. That he might keep me upon his level, he never sent me to school. But some half loved me for my half of her. A gamekeeper's wife taught me to read. A Catholic curate taught me Latin. There are old books and books made fine by 18th century French binding. Books modern and ancient, books by the ton. <laughs> what education have you given me? I gave the education that befits a bastard that a peddler got upon a tinkler's daughter in a ditch. When I had come to 16 years old, my father burned down the house when he drunk, when he was drunk. But, 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 but that is my age, 16 years old. That's a put there. And everything was burnt. Books, library, all were burnt. Is what I've heard upon the road the truth that you killed him in the burning house? There is nobody here but our two selves. Nobody, father. I stuck him with a knife, the knife that cuts my dinner now. And after that, I left him in the fire. They dragged him out. Somebody saw the knife wound but could not be certain because the body was all black and charred. Then somebody that were his drunken friend swore they would put me upon trial, spoke of quarrels, a threat I had made. The gamekeeper gave me some old clothes. I ran away, worked here and there till I became a peddler on the roads. No good trade, but good enough because I am my father's son because of what I did or may do. Listen to the hoofbeats. Listen, listen. Can I hear a sound? Beats, beats. This night is the anniversary of my mother's wedding night. Order the night where and I was begotten. My father is riding from the public house, a whiskey bottle under his arm. Look at that window. She stands there, listening. The servants are all in bed. She is alone. He has stayed late, bragging and drinking in a public house. There's nothing but an empty gap in the wall. You've made it up. Now you're mad. You're getting madder every day. It's slaughter now because he rides upon a graveled avenue, all grass today. The hoofbeat stops. He's gone to the other side of the house, gone to the stable, put the horse up. She's gone down to open the door. This night she is no better than her man and does not mind that he is half drunk. She is mad about him. They mount the stairs, she brings him into her own chamber, and that is the marriage chamber now. The window is dimly lit again. Do not let him touch you. It's not true that drunken men cannot be get, and if he touch, he must be get, and if you must bear his murder. Deaf, both deaf. If I should throw a stick or stone, they would not hear. And that's a proof my wits are out. But there's a problem. She must live through everything in exact detail, driven to it by remorse. And yet, can she renew the sexual act and find no pleasure in it? And if not, if pleasure and remorse must both be there, which is greater? I lack schooling. Go fetch Tertullian. He and I will ravel the problem out while those two lie upon the mattresses begetting me. Come back, come back. And so he thought to slip away. My bag of money between your fingers and that, I could not talk and see. You have been rummaging in the pack. You never gave me the right share. And I, and had I given it, young as you are, you would have spent it upon drink. What if I did? I had a right to get it and spend it as I chose. Give me that bag, no more words. I will not. I'll break your fingers. Uh, what, what if I killed you? You killed my granddad because you were young and he was old. Now I'm young and you are old. Better looking those 16 years. What are you muttering? Younger, and yet she should not have, she should have known he was not her kind. What are you saying? Out with it. My God, the window is lit up, and somebody stands there, although the floorboards are burnt away. The window is lit up because my father has come to find a glass for his whiskey. He leans there like some tired beast. A dead, living, murdered man? Then the bright, then the bright sleep fell upon Adam. Where did I read those words? And yet there is nothing leaning in the window but the impression upon my mother's mind. Being dead, she is alone in her remorse. A body, 
It was a bundle of old bones before I was born. Horrible. Horrible. That beast there would know nothing, being nothing. If I should kill a man under the window, he would not even turn his head. My father and my son on the same jackknife. That finishes that. I'm there. I'm there. Hush a bye, baby. Whoops. <laughs> Hush a bye, baby. The father's a knight. Thy mother's a lady, lovely and bright. No, that is something that I read, read in a book. And if I sing, it must be to my mother. And I lack rhyme. Study that tree. It stands there like a purified soul, all cold, sweet, glistening light. Dear mother, the window is dark again, but you are in the light because I finished all that consequence. I killed the lad. Because he had grown up, he would have struck a woman's fancy, begotten and passed on pollution. I am a wretched, followed man, and therefore harmless. When I have struck this old jackknife into a sod and pulled it out all bright again, and picked up all the money that he dropped, I'll to a distant place, and there I tell my old jokes among new men. Hoof beats. Dear God, how quickly it returns. Beats, beats. But her mind cannot hold up that dream. Twice a murderer and all for nothing. And she must animate that dead night not once but many times. Oh God, release my mother's soul from its dream. Mankind can do no more. Appease the misery of the living and the remorse of the dead. You get some idea of the pulse of Yeats. You get some idea of the work that he has done in trying to give us a sense of the tragic moment in Irish life. He is not a sentimentalist. And the plays deal with these a, uh, deep, deep tragedies. Now we have a few moments left, and I want to look at another one of Yeats's works, and that is The Wandering of Ocean. Now, you don't have this in your book, but uh, uh, give me a moment to bring the sheets out, and I'll uh, uh, discuss them with you. I'm sorry, just give me a moment. One of the figures in Irish poetry is the idea is the poet Ocean. And uh, when, when Yeats tries to draw from the past, not only does he bring historical figures, but he also brings the, uh, the ancient names of the poets themselves. He himself considers himself a bard of, uh, of Ireland. And you get these lines from Ocean. This is from his book, The Wandering Ocean. Uh, Ossianic poetry was very important. There's a man in the 18th century by the name of McPherson who claims to have recovered the works of Ocean. Uh, when people wanted to find out where the manuscripts were and where they came from, they could never get an answer from him. He probably wrote them himself. 
even though he said they came from ocean. But they became romantic uh, elements of romantic fiction, romantic literature, romantic narrative, romantic poetry. And uh, the romantic poets were very familiar with the Celtic writers and the works of Osho. Here, for example, are some lines from this book that Yeats wrote early in his career with Ocean citing heroic actions. <coughs> he says, sad to remember, sick with years, the swift innumerable spears, the horsemen with their floating hair, and bowls of barley, honey, and wine, and feet of maidens dancing in tune, and the white body that lay by mine. These, of course, become basic themes in this heroic Gaelic poetry. The wars settled, the heroes celebrating with food, the dance of the maidens, and of course, uh, uh, the sexual expression, the white body in bed. He goes on to talk. <coughs> the tale, though words be lighter than air. We find in the wanderings of ocean his confronting St. Patrick. You who are bent and bowed and blind with a heavy heart and a wandering mind have known three centuries poets sing of dalliance with a demon thing. Again, certain themes. These are themes of old age recalling their youth. This is a basic theme of the literature. Secondly, you have a heavy heart because the events have not turned out with the idealism you had hoped. You've not seen the lovers develop as you had wanted. You haven't seen the generation succeed but have been killed on the battlefield. And you've known three centuries. That is, these are not songs of just a few years ago. These are songs of a nation recalling its heritage. And finally, of dalliance with a demon thing. Now. Yeats met people, even in, in the, his uncle's household, in Pollockson's household, there was a woman who claimed she had second sight. She, she had this vision, and she could see into the future. The idea of ghosts, apparitions, sprites, isn't so odd. Isaac Basheva Singer, who was one of the Nobel Prize winners, we're going to read this year. Spoke in Houston some time ago, and he he asked if anyone in the room, there were about 500 people in the room, he, sa he asked if anyone in the room had seen a ghost. And then he said, don't be afraid to raise your hand. In any group of 35 people, one will at least have claimed to have seen a ghost in his lifetime. Now, of course, when you read Singer's works, You'll read that he writes about demons, and he writes about ghosts, and he writes about sprites, and he writes about devils, and he writes about the evil one. But so does Yeats. And when we think, speak about the demonic, we're not always speaking about some figure with horns and forked tail. We're talking about the spirit that animates one inside. When you look at this play, purgatory. It's purgatory because those in purgatory suffer the guilt that they forced upon themselves or brought upon themselves during their lifetime. Here's a father who realizes his mother was rejected by her own family. That's unheard of. Here's a daughter who engages in an illicit love affair with her groomsman. Here is a son who is witnessing again the moment of the consummation of his birth, 
and wondering whether it can be d done over again and over again or whether it's a single moment that passes and its consequences are as horrific of, uh, often as they are in this case. So the demon thing can be one's guilt and one's conscience that brings about the death of his own son because he knows that if you pass heroic action from father to son, you're going to pass polluted action, venal action, hedonistic action from father to son, and he wants it to stop. And so he kills his son so that his family no longer can be guilty of the punishments to which they have directed themselves. He goes on to discuss in the wanderings of ocean. He says, you shall know the Danan leisure, this is the Greek, and Neon be with you for a wife, this is from classical tradition. Then she sighs gently, it grows late, music and love and sleep await where I would be when the white Noon climbs, the red sun falls, and the world grows dim. That is, music and love and sleep are part of the nature of love. It's part of the myth of Aurora, Hesperus. Aurora and Hesperus wake in the morn looking for lovers, and by sundown, they are ready to go to bed with these lovers whom they've sought. And this becomes part of the myth that Yeats has brought into the wanderings of ocean. Here are some of the experiences. A hundred youths, mighty of limb, but knowing not tumult, nor hate, nor strife, and a hundred maidens, merry as birds, who when they dance to a fitful measure have a speed like the speed of the salmon herds, shall follow your horn and obey your whim. This is the response to the poet. The poet who writes about love will have these hundred youths who haven't yet been corrupted, who haven't fought in war, who haven't brought about the deaths of their fellows, who haven't suffered envy and greed, revenge and spite, and a hundred maidens, merry as birds, who when they dance to a fitful measure have a speed like the speed of the salmon herds. Now if you're going to look at poetic expression, salmon herds has a special epith uh, epithet quality to it. It's, it's an epitome. What is a salmon herd? Test your. Oh. Would that have some sort of sexual connotation, uh, perhaps? Well, s certainly the herds are breeding. Certainly you have this, say, the spawning, the, the salmon are spawning. Uh, salmon has a Shakespearean quality. Uh, the salmon express life. You want the salmon to be productive. You want to catch the salmon. Uh, there's a figure by the name of Llewellyn in one of Shakespeare's plays. And everything he says uh, is like salmon in one river and salmon in the other. They never come together. He's always speaking about different things and trying to bring together uh, um, uh, subjects that cannot be united. Here you've got salmon herds who are fish spawning. And they, uh, indeed, I think that's the connotation. The uh, birds also seems to sort of follow that, uh, the mention of the birds. You and shall like follow your horn and obey your whim. That is, these singers will listen to the song of the poet and they will respond in animated fashion. And of course, it's the sexual dance and the spirit of sexuality that is being celebrated by the poet with the young people. The old people, however, will suffer from the memories of the loves they held 
and of the disasters they suffered as a result of those loves. Here we have more of this love scene. No mightier creatures bay at the moon, and a hundred robes of murmuring silk, and a hundred calves, and a hundred sheep whose long wool whiter than sea froth flows, and a hundred spears, and a hundred bows, and oil, and wine, and honey, and milk, and always never anxious sleep. Again, Mr. Douglas, this is bring, bringing the basic theme of freedom, sexuality, love. But look at his, look at his rhythms. Look at the isocolon, the repetition. A hundred robes, a hundred calves. And then he equates, because he's a seafaring person, he equates the animal life with the sea. The long wool whiter than sea froth flows. The night garments, the bedclothes, the sheets are like the water and the froth of the sea. By the way, uh, that's one of the great characteristics of Herman Melville in America's greatest novel, Moby Dick. When Melville gives us land images, he paints them with sea uh, images. And when he gives us sea images, he paints them with land images. There's no difference. And when you live in Ireland, I suppose, and when you're surrounded completely by the sea, and when you're called the Emerald, uh, Emerald Isle because you're always green even in the winter, there's so much water, there's so much foliage, there's so much growth. The fertility meets the flir excuse me, the fertility myths flourish in the green of Ireland. Then sea and land always merge in the Cahulin myths and in the poems of Yeats. And we'll study more next week.